less than a year ago. Then the aircraft landing here brought the tourists, the human currency of prosperity, the vital tourists who would contribute so much to the new republics they once called Yugoslavia. Today, in Sarajevo, all that seems a lifetime away. Now the aircraft touching down here are different. Military freighters from many different countries. Their cargoes, no longer sun-loving tourists. Instead, food and medical material, vital life-saving supplies for the people of a town under siege. People under constant threat of death, from indiscriminate shelling, from indisciplined snipers. Everywhere there's appalling human misery. The breakup of Yugoslavia brought not a democracy-driven prosperity, but only revealed the bitter hatred long held under the surface by the old enemies, the Serbs and the Croats. Caught in between are the many Muslim communities. Hopes of peace are fading fast. The new Republic of Bosnia-Herzegovina has become the killing ground. Its capital, Sarajevo, is under constant artillery and mortar fire from Serbian-led forces in the surrounding hills. Its residential areas being systematically destroyed. The daily flights of food and medicine, its only hope of survival. The United Nations are here in Croatia and Bosnia, Units from no less than 18 different countries, from Russia to the Argentine. Among the UN forces is a contingent from Britain, the 24th Field Ambulance. They're to be found in an old Yugoslavian National Army camp on the edge of the airport at Zagreb in Croatia. Their job, to provide medical cover for all the UN forces in the Balkans conflict. Apart from the small group of medics in Sarajevo, theirs is a waiting game. Waiting for the moment, which will surely come, when they too will be called into action. Meanwhile, there's time to ponder on the bizarre situation in which all the UN troops, including the British, now find themselves. On the image they have with the local Croatians. I think they have expected a lot more from the UN than we have been able to provide. But then I don't think their expectations were really very sound. They almost expect us to solve the problem. And what we're actually here for is to give a breathing space. For the time being, the casualties now calling on the 24th Field Ambulance are mainly from the sports field. But even these cases can highlight a complaint heard constantly. While the French have modern ambulances, ours are ancient, 30-year-old Land Rovers, and even when emergency calls, not too reliable. There is speculation that new modern ambulances are on the way. But, as one British medic said sardonically, so is Christmas. The British UN contingent, 300 strong, isn't only medics. They're supported by many other units, including the Catering Corps, Remi, the Royal Corps of Transport, the Royal Ordnance Corps, the Royal Corps of Signals, and the Army Postal Service. And within a few days of their arrival in Croatia, the men from SSVC were there, providing the familiar BFBS radio service. And, via the new satellite, a full television network service too. They seemed to like it. Television, I mean, it's the ultimate uh, welfare item, morale item. Um, it does make a lot of difference to the guys, be able to use it and uh, actually, again, see the news, the sport, the sort of thing. It does make a great boost to morale. The horrors of Sarajevo are indeed many miles away, but the apparent peace and quiet here just outside Zagreb is very deceptive. 
here there's danger everywhere for the British troops because just before they were pushed out by the Croatian forces, the Yugoslav National Army planted mines all over the place. And many of those mines are still here. Just two weeks ago, a Croatian civilian cutting the grass here hit one of the mines and was killed. And now the grass is just being allowed to grow. Not letting the grass grow under their feet, the British packers just one vital link in the enormous chain to keep alive the people of Sarajevo, 300 miles away. Day and night, onto the airport at Zagreb come the trucks, huge lorries bringing the tons of food and medicine that will feed and sucker those traps behind the wall of Serbian fire. Everything essential is packed on specially designed pallets. They'll fit snugly into the cavernous bodies of the ubiquitous Hercules freighters, among the cargo, a product familiar to almost every British baby. The Herx and other cargo planes come from many countries, but at both ends, the airlift relies on British humanitarian expertise. The cooperation of the crews getting into Sarajevo is fantastic. The, uh, there is no, I've had no aircraft been delayed because of crews. It has been a fantastic cooperative effort before, uh, between all those involved and I couldn't ask for a greater bunch of guys. They have been fantastic. Everyone at Zagreb agreed. All the action was at Sarajevo, across the border in Bosnia-Herzegovina. A small British Army medical team was already in the thick of it. Getting to them would not be easy. By road was impossible. The Serbs held key positions. But we could take a chance. We could hitch a lift in the solitary Royal Air Force Hercules. We had the night to think about it. The first plane of the day the 6.15 to Sarajevo. The only stipulation on the invitation to hitch a lift, flak jackets will be worn. Pilots flying to Sarajevo have developed their own unique, safer way of landing. So the idea is to stay clear of ground fire. Uh, 1,500 feet, you're out of range of uh, effective ground fire. So we approach as quickly as we possibly can um, to minimise the exposure and to slow down at about four miles, putting the gear and the flap down, slowing down to a tactical uh, touchdown speed. At that point, take all the power off push the nose forward to uh, about 40 degrees nose down at the speed build up to the flat limiting speed. Pull the nose up, hopefully, <laughs> and uh, lose the, uh, let the speed wash off and touch down at uh, your normal tactical landing speed. It takes a bit of practice, but it's uh, not that difficult. Once on the ground, no time is lost in getting the Hercules unloaded and away. On the tarmac, 
they're especially vulnerable to shell fire. The record for a complete turnaround, just four minutes, 50 seconds. The first of the day's delivery complete, and right on cue, the mortars opened up. The end of the runway was hit. The result, as the Serbian attackers knew, was inevitable. OK, well, that last mortar attack on the airfield has now brought all the operation to a standstill. No aircraft are being allowed in or out. The entire airfield has been closed. The uh, UN have gone off into Sarajevo to talk to the leaders of both the warring factions to just find out just exactly why they are attacking the airfield. In the meantime, the supply of those vital supplies to the people of Sarajevo is, as they say, on hold and the people of Sarajevo will today get less than the bare minimum they need to keep going. I take the food into five warehouses. It's then the responsibility uh, of the, the local councils to get and to collect the food from the warehouses, which means they've got to find a truck. They've got to find fuel. If they found a truck and they found fuel, they then got to have security to get them to the warehouse. Whilst we're loading, we've got to be secure. They've then got to take their load into uh, their, town, their town area and they've got to distribute it. Now, when I, I've been to the, the front line there where people are being, uh, having the food distributed. They're crouching in corners, they're hiding in alleyways, uh, in, in the queue, because the sniper fire. The sniper fire is a real pest here, there's no doubt about it. Two days ago, uh, I went along to one of our warehouses. The door was open for me, a huge steel door. Uh, we went through with our vehicle, and immediately as, it was, as the door was being closed, a mortar bomb went through it, and it killed the chap that was closing the door. I mean, these are the examples of, of, of the hazards of trying to get food into town. I believe that it's getting in. For sure, the warehouses to where I deliver, they are, by and large, they're emptied within 24 hours. Our aim is to get the food uh, within 30 hours of touching down here into the mouths of people. I think we're doing as well as we can. I can't guarantee it's all getting there. Uh, it's a hard job. The people that I deal with every day who are Sarajevoans, I mean, that it's a Herculean task for them. The Serbians know they have the firepower to take the whole of Sarajevo any time they wish a dominating position they stress by stepping up the shelling and mortar attacks. And what they're firing at from that hilltop are those houses just over there, part of the Muslim enclave. As you can see, almost now totally destroyed. Most of the people now left. And the reason we're keeping our heads down is that a few moments ago, the UN you can hear that gunfire there. What happened is a few moments ago, the UN uh, watchman actually spotted some snipers over there, so we're taking no chances. And those are the conditions, by the way, in which the Royal Air Force here and the other British forces and the UN forces are having to face all the time, 24 hours a day. Five UN troops from the Ukraine manning a monitoring post have been hit. Two are critically injured. Meanwhile, the gunners of both sides stepped up their firefight around the airport. The fire that was coming from is up, on the, up over on the hill. There's basically about three tanks and uh, some sort of heavy machine guns and uh, a couple of mortars that, uh, that seem to be firing down either behind us or down into the area across from the airfield. But uh, the crumps that we just heard were actually outbound. They're going above us and they're actually going back and the, uh, the big clump of trees the big, uh, that uh, stands up on the top there. They just had uh, a couple of shells, quite heavy, heavy uh, artillery by the sound of it. But normally if that hill gets hit during the day, we have quite a bad night. But uh, last night they had uh, the first three shells they fired actually came down in, into here rather than behind us. So I mean, it's uh, the real threat here at the moment after, uh, you know, after we've had a couple of bad days where it seemed quite intentional. But uh, outside of that, the major, the major threat to this place is just, is just you know, the, uh, the, the shell that's uh, sort of inaccurate that's uh, sort of off target, so... Not to see. There are more healthy places to be. I can think of one or two. I can think of one or two. Oh, <laughs> there you see. go. Oh, that's They've just taken one. one. Yes, they've, they've just taken, taken one, one there. Look, yeah. on the top of the hill? Yeah. yeah. See? And I've taken another Take one. Another one right. 
this is going to get, uh, this could get a bit silly. We all go to the bunkers, please. Everybody to the bunkers, guys. Well, the uh, position's now being taken because of that uh, barrage. they have been now being evacuated, and we're going down to the bunkers here on the French sector, just here. These bunkers were built by the French when they arrived. <laughs> For a very good reason. Here we go. Good. It looks better. <laughs> Much better when you're out. That's for sure. The airport at Sarajevo will open again this day, but for only a few precious hours. Heavy shelling will close it again for several days. The people of Sarajevo will go without their supplies of food and medicine. The United Nations can make only one more desperate plea for some kind of peace. To the north of Sarajevo, in the Bosnian border town of Karlovac, are more victims of this Balkan tragedy, the refugees. Ordinary, peaceful families torn from their homes at gunpoint, forced to leave their towns and villages, able to carry only a pitiful few of their possessions. Their only crime, to be anything other than a Serb. More than a thousand men, women and children are crammed into the local sports centre. Tonight, many will sleep outside. There's a new terrible phrase in the vocabulary of all this violence, ethnic cleansing. These shocked and bewildered people are among its victims. Only the very young appear to have escaped the anguish and the agony. Ethnic cleansing, hopefully, will not have scarred their young minds. They still run errands, but not to the local shop anymore. If they're lucky, they'll get a free bottle of chocolate milk. Many of the grown-ups here are stunned, unable to believe the recent horrors that have robbed them of their homes, their families, their friends. Others do understand, and they're very angry. Cariton, America, ovu našu problematiku da reši Ujedinjenim nacijama da prenese da, ra, da laže Karadžić i Milošević, sve od slovolin i dvojica krivi. He says that uh, the world have to know, and America and the United Nations, that Karadžić and Milošević are lying. They did it all to us, and they are still lying. The world shouldn't believe them. That's what he says. But who listens? Who really cares? Germany apart, there's been a marked reluctance on the part of other European countries to allow in these refugees. So, where will they go? Will they ever again see their own homes? Well, if luck is the right word, then these refugees are indeed the lucky ones. They'll be going to Germany. When? Well, nobody can say. But then waiting is all part of the everyday life of the modern refugee.
problems that the British forces and the UN now have in supplying the people of Sarajevo will seem quite trivial in a few months' time when winter comes and the whole of this area will be covered in a thick blanket of snow and almost all the roads impassable. And certainly at the moment it seems quite clear that winter will be here far sooner than any real peace between the Croats, the Serbs and the Muslims. Three people who until recently appeared to be living in comparative peace but who now seemed only determined to destroy each other completely.